Hi, this is Doug Brignoli, and welcome to our program. The Brick 20 exercises are the exercises that, that are the most biomechanically correct exercises. That's a constant, but it doesn't explain how many sets you do and how many reps you do and the intensity you use, or whether it's for a beginner, for advanced, or for the application of sports training. You can take those Brick 20 and you can plug them into these various formulas, or you can use them sequentially. What this program will explain to you is how you can pick the novice program and you can stay with the novice program or you can move it into the intermediate program and either stay with the intermediate program or move it as a progression to the slightly more advanced program and either stay with that or use that as a stepping stone to the more advanced which is the four-way split and then either keep that as your constant program or use that as your sequential program and then go back to the beginning so you can apply this as an ongoing periodization program or you can pick and choose which program you like and stay with it now this will depend on what your goals are what your level of commitment is how much time you have all of these factors but the beauty of the program is that it lets you customize it for you Mo is going to show you how this program works how these phases move from one to the next I'm excited about this Mo's excited about it now let's get started Let's do a review. Here are the reasons why people think that straight-legged deadlifts are good for the hamstrings. Number one, they feel the stretch when their hip is fully flexed and their knees are straight or mostly straight. Okay, clue number one. Um, number two, they believe the hamstring plays a major role in hip extension. Why do they believe that? They've heard it. They haven't seen evidence of that, but they've heard it. Number three, some EMG studies have suggested that hamstring activation is high during a straight-legged deadlift. So let's look a little closer, but let me, before I turn the page here, let me just say that if I push my hands together like this and I create isometric tension in my chest and I put an EMG electrode on my chest, it'll register a high reading, high activation. So what an EMG measures is activation. Does not measure growth potential? Does not measure range of motion? Does not measure early phase loading or late phase loading? It just measures activation. That's a small part of what informs us of whether an exercise is actually productive. So let's start off with just a simple explanation. We need to understand what makes joints move, okay? Basically, it is the principle that when a muscle crosses over to the other side of a joint and then it contracts, it either bends that joint as in the case of a bicep or it extends that joint in the case of the tricep or the one there on the right is the quadricep. That's a knee joint. Okay, so in the case of the bicep or the tricep or the, or the quadricep, you can see there's one single tendon that the two or the three or the four muscles merge with. And so there's one action and that action is delivered by way of that one single tendon. In we're gonna look at hip extension here because hip extension is the primary action of a stiff legged deadlift. In the case of a, of a joint that has more than one muscle that is participating in that action, um, we can estimate the degree of participation of each of those muscles by three things. One is the size of that muscle, and the other is the origin and the insertion, the leverage of that muscle, okay? So I'm gonna show you a, um, a demonstration here. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is a model that I made of an arm and the bicep crossing the elbow joint, okay? so. I just added this and this insertion points today for the purpose of this video, but this is where the bicep insertion typically is. And when the bicep contracts, you can see it flexes the joint. Okay, so the distance between the joint and the insertion determines the amount of leverage, right? So the closer to the joint the insertion is, the less leverage. The farther 
on the other side of the joint, the insertion is, the greater the leverage. So if I were to take this little hook right here and clip it on there, right? And I pull on this thing, it's gonna require a certain amount of force more than this one did, but less. This one, this one requires less, okay? Because now what I have is a ratio of this to this versus this to this, okay? So the muscle that has the greater origin is the muscle that has the origin way above the hip joint and way below the hip joint. That's the greatest leverage. And the closer it gets to the actual joint, the less leverage, the less potential that joint actually has. Okay, so um, when we do hip extension, which is what happens during a straight-legged deadlift, there are three muscles that are participating in that action, the gluteus maximus, the adductors, and the hamstrings. Now, I've made the gluteus maximus in blue because it is the greater of the three muscles, as you'll soon see. The adductors and the hamstrings are lesser participants. Now, these three muscles participate in hip extension in different degrees. They're not all the same contributors, right? They have different degrees of participation, and we're going to see how that's determined. Okay, so let's start off with the gluteus maximus. This is in Physiopedia. You can see there, it, the gluteus is described as the largest and heaviest muscle in the body, not just of the three hip extension muscles. It's the biggest muscle of the body. It is a massive muscle. It weighs more than any other single muscle in the body. It has great leverage. It's very powerful. Here, what I'm showing you is that the, the green arrow is pointing to the hip joint. And I've got an arrow at the top and an arrow at the bottom showing the origin and the insertion of the gluteus. The origin is way above the, show, the uh, hip joint and the insertion is way below the hip joint. That's a lot of very powerful leverage, in addition to a lot of muscle mass doing the participation for hip extension, okay? The adductors are the second largest of the three hip extension muscles. Now, I want you to notice the insertion obviously is well below the hip joint. The origin is on the lower part of the pelvis, now, do you see those two little bony loops there at the bottom of the pelvis? That's called the ischial tuberosity. Okay, a small, the gracilis there, a small part of the adductor is connected to the ischial tuberosity, but most of the adductors are connected above the ischial tuberosity, which as you can see there is barely even with or slightly lower than the hip joint, which means that even though the adductors participate in hip extension, they can't participate as much as the gluteus maximus. It just doesn't have the leverage, nor does it have the mass, the size. So it is not a big player. This is the hamstring. It is the smallest of the three hip extension muscles, but look where its origin is. It's on the ischial tuberosity, lower than that of the adductors. So I've placed a green arrow there showing you where the joint is. So as I showed you on this thing here, you know, the closer it is to being on the other side of the joint, the less leverage you have. But as you can see here, the hamstring isn't even on the other side of the joint. It's on the same side of the joint as the insertion is. If you were designing a mechanism, let's say you were participating in, a, in, a, in an engineering class and your professor said, I want you to design a mechanism that makes this joint move and you turn this in, you'd probably get a failing grade. He would say, this is a terrible mechanism for moving this particular joint. I mean, will it play a role? Yeah, it will play a small role, but it is not, it cannot be a powerful contributor to hip extension action. It just can't. All right, let's look at the next one here. Now here, what I'm showing you is on the left, the A markers are the gluteus and the B is the adductors. So you can see the adductors are still fairly significant. They, they are bigger than the hamstring. And you can see that they participate almost equally, especially on the picture on the right, with 
hip extension. Now, I would argue that the adductors play less of a hip extension role as much as a counterbalancing force to the external rotation force of the gluteus maximus. Because the gluteus maximus fibers are at a diagonal, right? When you contract that muscle, the tendency will be for that femur to rotate externally. And in order to have that not happen, I think the adductor's job is to keep the femur straight. And so that's why we feel a lot of adductor participation when we squat, we might feel soreness the next day. Um, we can't say for sure that it's because the actor played a forceful role in, role in the hip extension. It might be that they played a significant role in preventing external rotation of the, of the femur. But in any case, it is certainly bigger than the hamstring. So I encourage you to try this experiment at home. You can try it now, you can try it later. I want you to pull your leg up with your knee bent, right? And ask yourself, where do I feel that, right? So if you pull it in, you feel it in the glute. If you pull it out, you feel it in the adductor, but you feel nothing in the hamstring, nothing. And that's because the hamstring is a knee-oriented muscle. Unless that knee is straight, you can't even stretch it by fully flexing your hip. Whereas the quadrus, excuse me, the gluteus and the adductors are hip-oriented muscles. They participate more in hip action than the hamstring can and than the hamstring does. It's just, that's just the nature. If you look at the mechanics, that is the nature of it. So now let us assign some percentages of participation of these three muscles. Okay, now what I've done here is I've lowballed it. I've said, let's just say the glutes participate 70% of the force production in hip extension. It's probably 80% or more. I wouldn't be surprised if the gluteus maximus is 82, 83% of the force producer in hip extension. Okay, but let's just say conservatively, 70%. That leaves 30% that theoretically could be shared between the adductors and the hamstring. That's not actually the, the case because they can't possibly be even contributors. I mean, it's obvious the adductor plays a bigger role. It has to be because of the leverage and the size, right? But even if they played an equal role, that means the hamstring is only a 15% contributor to hip extension. Just by looking at the mechanics of it. It could be 10%. It could be 8%. It is not a strong hip extension muscle. And yet you're doing hip extension for hamstring development. What's the percent of participation that your hamstrings play in electoral? 100%. You're going to compare a 100% a participation exercise with an 8 or a 10% participation exercise? This is what I mean by opening our eyes, using our logic, asking ourselves, does this even make sense? Why would we spend all this time and energy doing an exercise that's, that's arguably not very fun to do, not very comfortable? I mean, if you're doing it for the glutes, all right, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't support that to some degree. With a slightly more bent knee and an arched back, I would support that to, to some degree. It's still not the best, but certainly it is a better gluteus exercise than a hamstring exercise. The hamstring just can't play much of a role. So now let's look at these EMG studies that showed, quote, significant activation of the hamstring during straight-legged deadlift. Again, EMG analysis does not measure muscle growth nor potential muscle growth. EMG uh, analysis measures activation. Doesn't care if it's dynamic or isometric. Doesn't care if it's early phase or late phase. These are all factors in muscle development, by the way. The EMG analysis shows a high mark, high activation for an isometric exercise, even though that's not a very good exercise. Um, it'll also show for a late, I'll show you here these studies, for a late, loaded, a late phase loaded exercise. Neither of those are good muscle building exercises. EMG analysis can be very misleading. Okay, so here, these are exercises for triceps. Now, you'll see the kickbacks there measured significantly higher than a lying barbell tricep extension. Now, we can say, why? Right now, Mike Israel knows 
that an early phase loaded exercise like a line barbell tricep extension is significantly more productive than a late phase loaded exercise like the tricep kickback. In fact, we could argue that the kickbacks is a lousy tricep exercise in comparison to an early phase loaded exercise. But if you're one of these people that claims to be evidence-based, and this is what's bothersome to me is we don't, people don't question the evidence. People, people don't say that doesn't make sense. People don't say, well, I would, I would go so far as to say that some of these people that claim to be trainers, I'm not saying Mike, I'm saying, you know, some of these novice young trainers that have never been in the trenches that don't know the way Mike does that a skull crusher is a fantastic tricep builder. You live it, you breathe it, you know it. You do a tricep kickback and you feel the fact that you can't use nearly as much weight. You're completely depriving the stronger part of the range of motion. You're loading up the weakest part of the range of motion. The entire exercise is limited to the weakest part of that range of motion. It is a lousy tricep exercise, but if you're evidence-based and you don't have a lot of context and you don't know how to question these things, You'll say, oh, no, I mean, I'm going to train my clients for tricep kickbacks because the evidence shows that. No, 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 don't do tricep, don't do lying skull crushes because, you know, the evidence shows that's an inferior. We can't, we can't do this. We have to use our brain. Here's another EMG study. Now, this showed that the power wheel had more rectus abdominis activation than the ab crunch. Now, those of us who have experienced this know that, you know, you're on your hands and knees, you're rolling this thing out, you're not getting very much movement through the spine, you're not actually elongating the rectus abdominis and shortening the rectus abdominis the way you want to do with most dynamic exercises, right? It's mostly isometric, you're mostly moving at the hip, and there's a lot of other things working that don't need to be working, um, hip flexors and lats and <laughs> triceps and all kinds of things. And you're getting this very, very compromised benefit to the rectus abdominis as compared to a good abdominal crunch, which is just a killer exercise, right? Again, this doesn't make sense. So you can't just say, oh, I, I'm going to use this particular EMG study to support, you know, the fact that the upper pecs uh, benefits from incline presses and that hamstrings benefit from stifligate because you're picking and choosing, right? You know darn well that a lot of these studies don't make sense. So you can't then use the one you like. Here's another one. Now we know that if you do a side plank, you're going to get isometric tension on the, on the obliques, the internal external obliques, right? Now, if you're evidence-based, you'd say, oh, this is a really good exercise. In fact, I'm gonna make it a little bit more challenging by raising my upper leg up. Now, what I'm doing is I'm showing you that that kind of sideways pressure on that lower leg is definitely not healthy for a knee joint. Now you might be able to tolerate it if you're young and you have stable knees. If you're not young and you don't have stable knees, putting this much body weight side pressure on that lower leg could potentially hurt those tendons, those ligaments, I mean, that are actually keeping your leg straight. <laughs> There's also obviously a lot of body weight that you're jamming into that shoulder socket, all right? Not, necess not necessarily productive. If you wanted to do an isometric exercise, by the way, for the obliques, you could just pick up a cable from the side and just stand there with it. You'd have none of this sideways pressure on their knee and none of this, you know, jamming the shoulder joint if you wanted to do isometric. But again, the point of this picture is to show you that this would rate as a high value exercise by EMG studies for the external obliques, even though it's not dynamic even though there's no extension and contraction, there's no elongation and shortening. It just doesn't make sense. So here, what I wanna show you is, as an example, you have a guy, he's gonna make a rabbit disappear. Poof, it's gone. It's a magic trick. You've seen similar things like this, magic shows. Do you actually believe the rabbit disappeared? You don't. You know the rabbit, you know it's a trick. You know it's not as it appears. And why do you know that? because you have a brain and because you know the universe has rules. And in this case, the rule is the, cons the conservation of mass. Things don't, things can't spontaneously disappear. You know that just like you know 
the rule of the line of force. Whatever is directly opposite the line of force will be the most loaded. That's another rule, just like the conservation of mass, that is unequivocal. We have to look at logic, science, reason, and then mix it with these things that we see and, and decide when to believe, when not to believe what we're seeing. Daniel Borston is credited with this quote. The greatest obstacle to progress is not the absence of knowledge, but the illusion of knowledge. And this is the problem. This is pervasive in a lot of areas where someone thinks they know and they move through the world preaching what they think they know, close-minded, not thinking of the possibility that maybe I don't have all the information necessary to know the truth. People are out there professing their illusion of knowledge with no interest in hearing or reading, i.e. my book, new information which could provide a better perspective and in this case, allow your training to be more efficient. What does efficient mean? It means spending the least amount of energy to get the most amount of benefit. Not wasting time on an exercise that only has an 8% participation. Logically speaking, it's impossible for the hamstring to contribute more than approximately 15% of the hip extension force because of its poor mechanics and the dominance of the glutes. The EMG analysis is obviously registering the loaded hamstring stretch as activation. It does not register the limited force production nor insufficient range of motion. So if you wanna say, well, if it's measuring loaded stretch, isn't that good? Isn't that productive? And the answer is very simply, if it is productive, if it is good, if it is adequate, then we would be using that and only that for everything else. And yet there isn't a single other exercise that we do in the gym that only is loaded stretch. By the way, you can do a seated leg curl, pull yourself forward and get hamstring stretch and knee flexion. You get the best of both worlds. So why do an exercise that only has the stretch part. It just doesn't make sense. So Mike uh, posted this on the video. The book, again, pretending he read it, claims that SDLs don't cause enough muscle contraction. Then he says it's absurd. And then he, he uses that, uh, again, that, uh, that study that showed the EMG analysis. I'll tell you what's absurd, is to know the limited force capacity of the hamstring during hip extension and still endorse it. That's absurd. Seeing the mechanics, seeing that this hamstring muscle cannot produce more than 8%, 10%, maybe 12%, maybe less of the hip extension force production. And yet you're going to do it for hamstring development? That's absurd. Also absurd is not knowing the compromised mechanics of the hamstring and pretending to be an authority in resistance exercise. Anyone who's, who wants to be an authority has to understand the mechanics. You can't just close your eyes and say, well, the EMG study said this. You have to use your eyes. You have to use your brain. You have to look behind the curtain. Something doesn't make sense here. Also absurd is knowing the limitations of EMG analysis and then using it as, as evidence, even though you refute other EMG studies because, well, you think they're absurd. Well, either we, either we understand that an EMG study is limited in all cases, or we don't. We have to understand it's a limited value. Now, here's a picture of me doing leg curls. This is, uh, I would say, 1986. Um, decent hamstrings never did straight legged deadlifts, never liked them. Even before I understood the mechanics the way I do now, I just intuitively thought this is nonsense compared to a leg curl. You can get more than adequate hamstring development. Leg curl, and this is, this is back when, you know, we didn't even have a seated leg curl yet. You can see that we, we had already gotten to the, beyond the flat leg curl. You know, <laughs> they were putting a hump. This is a flex leg curl machine. They were already putting a hump in it tacitly acknowledging that the hip needs to have a degree of bend 
to um, avoid, they didn't know it yet, but to avoid active insufficiency, which is what happens when your hip is too straight. This is a picture of my hamstring at the age of 54, which was about eight years ago. Again, just leg curls. That's from, that's a side view, age 54. You can get plenty of hamstring development with a leg curl if you have the genetics that allows you to develop hamstrings. If you don't, step like a deadlift aren't gonna, aren't gonna solve that problem for you.